morning everyone um uh, thank you so much for gathering today up and early i'm sure uh, we had some wonderful Bats sessions yesterday and uh, hope to uh, start this one as well with oh, the uh, to, with to the insights here. and Achha, the inspiration okay. we had uh, yesterday um uh, you know i want to actually start by saying that uh, a country of 1.4 billion people uh but we won only seven medals in uh, the last olympics in tokyo in 2020 uh but you know as athletes we are optimists right we have world champions we have olympic champions we have multiple olympic champions and uh with now india being so dominant in various other fields right in in economics in medicine in engineering in tech in the startup community we ask ourselves this questions this question once every 4 years right where are we in the world of sport and uh, as athletes we are optimists today uh, uh, i'm joined uh, by somebody super special to share light uh, with us on what is happening in india in the future of sport and uh, it's my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce uh, this person uh, sitting next to me uh, mrs aparna popat she's a two time olympian in 2000 and 2004 olympic games she's a four time medalist at the commonwealth games with a silver medal at the world junior championship which was the very first uh, she was the very first one uh, to win this medal for india she's a 16 time national singles championship title winner uh, within a span of 17 years so think about the dominance aparna had in indian badminton including nine consecutive senior badminton titles equaling uh, the legend uh, uh, prakash padukone's uh, record uh, aparna's represent india in multiple asian games commonwealth games and world championships and was conferred also the arjuna award by uh, the president of india in uh, 2005 post uh, her illustrious uh, playing career aparna has got a masters in business administration she has also been the executive director of the olympians association of india and now in a very very interesting role as the chief operating officer of uh, a tech startup called all is well aparna is all about unlocking uh, uh, sport uh, performance fitness and the future of sport science taking indian sport to the next level very warm welcome aparna thank you so much neha um, i think it's a great way to start the morning and i think as we are athletes i know it's the first session of the day but uh, you know glad to be off the blocks uh, so early and to be the first one to do so so uh, thanks so much uh, first of all uh, thank you to aima for inviting me here today and Uh, for having us here for this very interesting session um i know a lot of people love to watch sport but it's it's also i hope equally interesting to listen to stories about sport and i think that's what we're here for so um yeah really looking forward to the session thanks aparna and also very warm welcome to mr anil somani the founder and executive director chairman of uh, first timer business school thank you sir for being here with us thank you so much thank you aima and thank you very much uh aparna i want to start with you uh you know what an illustrious career you've had but i want to take you back to your journey when you started badminton back in the day right to me it's very fascinating being a woman playing a sport uh, which was not really uh, you know the most well sought sport when you played in an era what was that journey like and what were the some of the challenges that you faced in your career well i think you know honestly i come um, from a non sporting background so when i took up sport um, i took it up purely uh, because i love to play sport and uh, you know you say you when you take up sport you have aspirations to be an olympian or to be world number 1 it was nothing of the sort i think i just wanted to play sport um and play it with all my heart so as a child i used to play badminton 7 uh, days a week uh, and managed school accordingly um and and did really well at academics as well so Uh, I think at that point in time things were simple. It it sort of gets complicated when you start competing, and when you perceive to be an elite sports person, and then that's where you realize 
um, the challenges that come along the way. Um, I represented Senior India uh, from when I was 14 years old. So uh, playing the Uber Cup, uh, being the youngest member uh, at the age of 14, and then continued until my retirement at the age of 28. Um, I think, you know, you think when you're India number one, people will look up to you, people will give you things that you want. Um, nothing of the sort at that stage happened. I think there were challenges uh, right in terms from uh, resources and infrastructure. And I'll give you a few examples. Uh, when I was already senior national champion two, three years into um, the nine year record that I had, uh, I remember struggling for shuttles. Uh, the shuttles that we were given to play with at national camps um, had yellowed. So otherwise the typical badminton shuttle is white in color it had all become yellow because the stock was so old. So you'd hit like a couple of shots and the feathers would break off. Um, the courts that we played on, um, you know, if you're familiar with the synthetic green court that you see on TV. So basically that court at that point had, it has segments and those segments are sort of put together with a zip. Now the zips of these segments of the courts were broken off. So every day when we went for practice, literally the first 10 minutes would go into actually getting to see, getting these segments together, running around, finding tape to tape it off because, you know, leaving that one little detail undone could mean that you would be injured and that could sort of put your entire career at risk. So that was as far as the facilities were concerned. Um, I think funding, uh, I remember struggling for funds uh, at my first Olympics as well uh, in 2000. So I had almost qualified, but I had to play maybe a couple of more tournaments uh, to sort of secure and cement my qualification. And I remember my dad running from pillar to post looking for a sponsorship just to play one tournament, um, just to secure uh, my qualification. So, um, and now, you know, in comparison at that time, we used to play eight tournaments in a year. Uh, now, in comparison, the players play between 18 to 20 tournaments in a year. So you had to qualify, basically attain your spot with that much less opportunity and competition. So I think that's, um, and then of course, the challenge of being a woman uh, and, and playing this sport. Uh, I will say it is one of the kinder sport to, to the female gender because there's equal representation on both sides. Now, of course, the BWF is equal prize money as well. but the challenges of being a female national champion vis-a-vis -a, -vis a men's national champion, I think there's a huge difference in the way people look at you. Um, and I think that was almost the driver, right? To push yourself to be better. I think if you, if the team was being selected, there would be four men singles players in the team and one women singles player in the team, which really meant that if I wasn't India number one, um, and I wasn't national champion, and I wasn't the top of the ranking, uh, the domestic rankings, there could be a reason I could be dropped. And if I was dropped, I would lose 12 months of international competition, not one or two tournaments, the entire year. So that's how it worked. So just, I think that was the motivating force to actually take this journey forward. And um, People think that you have regrets. I think there are no regrets whatsoever. Um, with whatever resources that I had at hand, I think I did my utmost best. Um, could it have been better? Could I have been better? Uh, 100%. But it was what it was. And But I'm really glad that Indian sport has really picked up and it is at the place that it is today. Well, I think that itself deserves a huge round of applause. I mean... Uh, I think uh, you are the one who really inspired the next generation of women's badminton. Uh, because, uh, so uh, the last Olympics Aparna played was in 2004. And then came uh, the era of uh, Saina Nehwal and PV Sindhu. So in 2008 Olympics, when I played, uh, Saina lost a close match in the quarterfinals and could have played the semis. And uh, that we could have won a medal that itself. She went on winning a medal in 2012 and post that in 2016 uh, uh, PV Sindhu came on and again uh, a second medal in 2020 Olympics Games. So Aparna really you've been the driver of women's uh, badminton to what it is today. I think it, in my last national championships which was the ninth record title um, I beat Saina in the finals 
And it was later that year that she won her first international tournament at the Philippines Open. And then, of course, we know, um, you know, her journey to world number one. So. Yeah, and and you know, in in other fields and and in sport as well, right? You need that one person to really break the glass ceiling, and uh, uh, really to play the Olympics once, not once but twice, is uh, it itself is, is is sort of a testimony to the continued uh, uh, sort of legacy and uh, success that Aparna has seen, and and you know, Aparna. Back in the day, uh, I remember, uh, you know, sports like table tennis, badminton, uh, right? Very limited infrastructure. Today, uh, you all will be happy to know there are about 7,000 badminton courts in uh, in Bangalore and similar number in Hyderabad. And I'm sure when you played, uh, you know, there were, what, 30, 40 badminton courts. So what's the change that you've seen in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the facilities now the athletes are getting and how does that promote to the development of overall Indian sport? You know, um, interestingly, badminton is one of the sports in India that is can really be a case study because um, coming, like, so I stopped playing in 2006 and then the way I've seen the sport grow, um, it's tremendous, right? You've just given numbers of the badminton courts. You see there are so many tournaments happening, the participation, the interest, the awareness of the sport, um, the performances. You know, if you talk about uh, the world championships in particular, India has medaled uh, at every world championships in badminton since 2011. So um, I think that is a sort of consistency. I think the last three Olympic Games we have medals uh, through badminton. And um, what I'm really proud of is that all this has been done through an entirely homegrown system. We have not had foreign coaches. We have not had foreign expertise except in bits and pieces where it's been plugged in. But it has been done through a process and through teamwork. And hence, we, we see performances over a period of time. Um, you know, so when, when you go on shows and when I do TV commentary um, and when we talk about badminton, we say, okay, you know, when we got our first world championship medal, this is this is where badminton is, this is it. And then you see the next tournament, Olympics, you get a medal saying this is the highest badminton can go. And then you look at the Thomas Cup, for example, I think a tournament that has not been given enough credit in India to understand, um, in uh, to sort of simplify it, it was the world championship for men's team yeah. badminton. We are world champions in that sense. So. Um, I think coming from that, you see Satvik Chirag's performances today. You see, you know, Shrikant and uh, Saina have been world number one. Uh, Sindhu is a world champion. So there's just like so many things to talk about. Um, also, at the junior level, we have a lot of success. Uh, our camps are going really well. Um, there's, a, there's money that's come into badminton. And I think that is the biggest validation, right? To know that your sport has uh, achieved and reached a particular level. So, um, you know, Sindhu, if you look at the Forbes list of top uh, women sports persons in the world, uh, you know, Sindhu features on that list in the top 10. So uh, I think it's just a validation of the fact that if it can be done in one sport, why can this process not be replicated in other sports uh, as well? And, um, you know, it's, it's possible. I think the belief, as you said, you need maybe that one role model, that one icon, uh, to actually inspire not the next generation, but many generations after that, I think badminton can be that sport that can inspire the change in the Indian sports ecosystem. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, for inspiring change, driving change, uh, a lot has to do with uh, overall culture of sport. Uh, uh, you know, uh, overall, uh, I think India's preparation for 2020 uh, Olympics and now uh, as, uh, you know, we have nine months to go to the uh, Paris Olympic Games next year, uh, a lot has been done. So from the government side, uh, we have the top scheme coming in, uh, a lot of funding and very focused funding funding coming in to sport, a lot of private organizations coming in as well. Do you see uh, India now becoming a sporting nation from two perspectives? One is from the grassroots perspectives. Are we still playing sport at household levels or, and from the high performance perspective? Um, yeah, so 
you know, a lot in, in the Indian sports ecosystem is going on well. Uh, we know the performances. Uh, we, you know, know about our world champions. Um, you know, you speak of Neera Chopra, or you speak of Mirabai Chanu, or, you know, you speak of Sindhu, uh, you know, and, and there are just so many role models and icons, right, to look at. Uh, parallelly, I think the mindset in India has changed tremendously. Uh, we used to look at sport as a pastime, um, you know, then as a form of entertainment, but now also extend it to look at um, the fact that it could be, uh, you know, a, a great sort of motivator and impact social change as well as be an economic growth driver. So the mindset has completely changed. Um, what has really gone well uh, for us is the policies that have come in. Um, India did not have a sports policy till 1984, obviously because as a country like ours, we had other concerns at that point in time. But since then, we've not only got a robust sports policy, a, a big sports budget, but we've also got the states having their own sports policies that again go beyond and just to connect your point, right from the grassroots to the elite. So there's, there's enough infrastructure mass participation at the grassroots, addressing social problems in the uh, state, as well as the incentives and employment on the other side. So these sports policies are very, very useful. Um, and then, of course, there's the sports code, um, you know, that was drafted in 2011 and then, you know, revised in 2017. So policies really drive um, that change. Funding, uh, said the sports budget, close to about 3,400 crores um, of, of uh, money allocated to sport. We know the amount of encouragement athletes are getting nowadays. Uh, so that's there. I think um, synergy is, is very, very important. You mentioned, um, you know, there are many stakeholders in sport. And over the years, I think that there were a lot of leakages because these people wouldn't work together. So now you look at um, the, the ministry and uh, you look at the Sports Authority of India, the IOA, you look at national sports federations, state federations, I think corporates, PSUs and NGOs like OGQ, um, you know, and Go Sports and JSWK actually coming together and working very seamlessly so the athlete gets, you know, 100% support. Um, I think that has really also worked very well. Uh, what really, I think, will make this sustainable is to understand that what is required at the elite level um, and what is required to promote grassroots sport is very different in many ways. Uh, yes, the aim is to sort of look at India to become a sporting uh, superpower, but, um, you know, I, I believe, I think, uh, that both these could be kept separate, under separate bodies and organized in that sense. And just to give you an example, I think, um, so UK Sport and Sports England are two organizations, you know, within UK that actually look at exactly what I'm saying. There's a partition. UK Sport is more about the elite sport and Sports England uh, promotes the grassroots sport as well as sports in society. Um, I feel if we can professionalize and make this bifurcation very clear, we will be able to hit both these ends, and I literally call them ends because that's what they are, uh, and in between there's a long journey. Um, I think if we professionalize both these ends, then we could achieve um, success in both at the same time. Um, India is a big country, right? Uh, it has huge potential. It has huge, huge opportunities, but being such a vast country and having the talent that we have, it also becomes an operational nightmare. To actually get everything together requires that level of organization and clarity and vision. And then uh, perhaps, you know, we can get successful at both ends. Sport is cruel. We look at numbers and we only look at numbers at the Olympics uh, once in four years, at the Asian Games once in four years. Um, but we forget to see what all is happening in between. Uh, you know, it's you're, you're vying for number one, two, three from the entire world. And if we don't get on that podium, we think everything is wasted. It's not. So how can we make that journey, um, you know, better. There's always room to be better. As you started off, we sports people are very optimistic. Uh, we're also very ambitious. Um, 
and we really hope that you know in time to come uh, you know we can sort of get this more organized um, and then we will see success there's no question about it you know, I love uh, what you said that uh, uh, it's uh, about getting the first, second or the third position. Um, but, you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, especially for our young girls, sport is a must. Um, you know, what, uh, what we achieve, uh, what we try to achieve at the end of the day is uh, podium finishes. But what really sport does it, it builds character, um, right? I came from a very conservative Marwadi uh, Indian background and there was no way I would have played sport if not for my father who just thought that his daughter should do different. And if not for sport, uh, right, I I'm not sure if I would be here. And what it has really taught me is uh, perseverance, discipline, confidence, uh, right? The ability to handle success, but also to handle defeat, uh, which something the four walls of classroom really does not teach. And I'm sure it would have been the same for you, Aparna. So your thoughts on, you know, just why for a country like India, you know, sport is essential for our kids, uh, despite the fact that we are still struggling with, uh, you know, other bigger pressing problems like uh, poverty, education, women's welfare and those th those things. Um, you know, the thing with sport is, right, because there's just so much glamour at the top and you look at medals, everybody's attracted to that. Uh, you know, when you, when, you know, I'm sure you handle partnerships, so you understand a lot of people want to sponsor or support where there is a chance of getting that recognition. Um, there's, there's not enough support for the grassroots. And I think that is really because sport has no guaranteed ROIs, right? Um, it's very uncertain. Uh, it's very uncertain. Yesterday we had conversations about, um, you know, startups and we were discussing and you look at the journey of an entrepreneur. It's no different for a sports person. You start off with nothing. Um, you try to build yourself up and you don't know whether there would be success at the other end or not. And mind you, this is like almost a 10, 12, 15 year long journey, right? Um, it's so it's similar in that sense. Why is sport really important? Uh, you know, you've mentioned uh, what you can learn from sport, but you know, going beyond that, it's also a great medium, and especially in today's day and age, to also de-stress. It's also a place where you can come and be together. I think have that community uh, to have that connect. And I know a lot of people who play uh, sport uh, come and say that my sporting buddies are my best buddies. Like I'm closest to them because you, you, you know, play on the same team or you, you know, you're running together or you're sharing those experiences every morning. Um, so I think it's, it's more than just building an individual. It's about building a community. It can build societies. Uh, very importantly, it can build great values. Um, I think values is something that India is known for, is big on, and what better way to build these values through than through a fun medium like sport. Uh, we look at the values of Olympism, which is friendship, excellence, and respect. Um, this comes through sport, right? The resilience, as you mentioned, comes through sport. Um, can it be fun? Can we make it fun? Can we make the experience of sport very good? Uh, if the experience of sport is good, I think you're likely to play sport for a longer period of time, uh, which is what you want, because as we age, health becomes a big concern. So can we play sport and then carry it through um, to the rest of our lives? But this, again, will only happen if there's enough investment at the grassroots level. Um, investment for infrastructure uh, of safe playing spaces. Do we need top class, top notch stadiums all the time? Maybe not. We need smaller, more accessible sports stadiums that are safe to play the sport, um, which again includes, you know, being girls and women playing sport. You want a space that is safe for them to play sport um, and, and you want more of them in number. Uh, you want good coaches at that point in time. These coaches need to be paid well, so we need the support. Uh, we need a structured program, uh, hence we need the support. Um, and 
believe it, there are tons of stories where uh, sport has not only been a part of your life, but it has transformed lives. That is the power and potential of sport. And India um, still hasn't tapped into that power and potential. The awareness is there, we're talking about it, but can we actually get it executed is something that needs to be seen. I think very well uh, said, Aparna, and uh, which actually leads uh, me to uh, my next question on uh, really taking care of our athletes, uh, uh, right? Uh, you all will be interested to know that uh, India actually takes care of its athletes better than China does. Uh, the most common injury in contact sport is the ACL injury that happens in the in the knee, the anterior crucial ligament. Um, there is no concept of ACL surgeries in China because it requires about nine months of rehab. And if not uh, for that, uh, you know, they have a whole team coming in and, uh, uh, you know, replacement. So it doesn't have patience to take care of our athletes when they are injured. And I think India does a brilliant job while doing that. And when we do that, we also need to make sure our athletes are secured in their careers because what what in life post-retirement. Uh, so your thoughts on how India does well in that perspective? Uh, I think, you know, straight away, um, I'll just take my personal example. So when I was playing, um, I was obviously, so I played the age group events in under 12 and I won the nationals, under 15, two titles, under 19, four titles, and then seniors, nine. And this would not have been possible if I wouldn't have had the support of certain institutions. Um, so at the age of 16, I was supported on a scholarship by Air India um, for a couple of years. And then Indian Oil took me on, on probation. Uh, and then when I turned 18, they confirmed me uh, as a sports person to play for Indian Oil. And then once I retired from the sport, um, they have this section as they decategorize you and make you a regular employee, but you still have a secure job. Um, you know, when you look at the world uh, at large and you look at professional sports persons elsewhere, they don't have this luxury. Okay, they have to really manage their expenses, um, you know, and actually work their careers as a professional uh, while maintaining their sporting performance, which is really hard. So um, while we want to say, you know, Indian sports persons don't have the support. I think in a lot of ways they do. Our government is doing a brilliant job. There are organizations like the PSUs that are doing uh, excellently well. Um, so yes, there is support. Uh, where we were actually lacking the support was in terms of things like infrastructure, in terms of sports science, in terms of um, just having somebody to put a structure to your entire training program. Uh, we needed good leadership at, at federations who could actually sort of have the vision and pull um, the sport forward. And I think again, badminton is, we had that at, at the time when Saina was playing. Uh, at the time, uh, why, and this is, I feel that Indian sport really had a fillip, say in, in around 2008, when the government you know, pumped in money into sport with the oncoming 2010 Commonwealth Games in Delhi. I think that was the real change and that's why Indian sport is where it is today. So uh, the government does a lot of stuff. Um, can it be better? Can governance be better? Yes. Uh, you know, can we get more professionals working in the sports space? Yes. Uh, I think what we really need is more homegrown systems that are more sustainable rather than getting experts from abroad coming and working for a period of time, going back, and then it, the continuity doesn't remain. I think we've got enough talent, not only for sports persons to play, but we've got enough talent on the other side to manage, um, you know, and, and do the governance and, and look at the administration and operations and, and all the good stuff. So encourage Make in India. Can we learn from outside? Absolutely. Can we get experts from outside? Yes, please bring them in, but learn from them, send them back and then, you know, have your own system, have your own formula. I think we, we can do that. We're in a position to do that now. We weren't many years ago. Um, yeah, but that's just what I feel. Wonderful. I think a big round of applause for Make in India in sport as well uh, by a partner.